thank you so much for coming and braving the weather. It's quite the storm out there today. And I'm very, very pleased that you did make it. Um, we do have seminars every couple of weeks on Wednesday. And uh, today we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Michael Gordon, a world-renowned physician and doctor and uh, research advocate. And we are very pleased that he's here uh, to talk to us about research and aging. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So just to frame it, I'm actually a geriatrician. I look after older people. I'm an academic geriatrician. I work in the academic center in Toronto. I'm affiliated, of course, with the University of Toronto. And I'm not a primary researcher. I'm a primary clinician teacher. But some years ago, I went back to study ethics. I got my master's in ethics from the University of Toronto. Uh, and since that time, a lot of my focus, my academic focus, has been on ethics as it relates to issues in aging. Uh, and of course, a lot of that is clinical ethics, and clinical aging, and decision making, end of life, a lot of the difficult challenges. But invariably, if you're in an academic center, you can't avoid considering the implications in the world of research of both ethics and aging. So what I want to do is sort of frame some of the challenges that we all face. And physicians aren't always aware, just because of their natural tendency uh, to try to integrate research into practice, of the background that goes into the, 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 the um, influences that go into uh, the research enterprise. Now, research is obviously a very important element to everything we do. And I'm talking about in the realm of medicine. I'm not talking about astrophysics, oceanography. We know that research is important in all kinds of areas. I'm focusing on the practice of medicine. We, practitioners, just plain doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, whoever works in the field of medicine, ultimately depend on the research enterprise in order to do what we do. We don't always think of it as we're going along, but invariably almost every decision we make and every recommendation we give to patients and families has a background of research in one way or other supporting it. Now the research may be thin, or the research may be very robust. It depends on the decision and what the elements are. So I'm gonna focus on one where it's obviously very robust, because that's the easy one. And why it matters how we relate research to ethics and because I'm a geriatrician in age. So I'm going to give some examples of why it's important, why it's important to understand the considerations and the impact of the, the way things happen and the decisions we make. So let's look at, for example, the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm not here to denigrate the pharmaceutical industry, because that's easy. Everybody can criticize the pharmaceutical industry, and it's a popular activity, it's like a sport. You know, you can easily criticize the pharmaceutical industry, and sometimes the criticisms are very valid for all kinds of reasons. And for those of us like myself who travel to countries, it's clear that the expectations and standards and relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and practitioners varies from place to place, and in a sense, What's happened in Canada and the United States, because we share a lot, we can see an evolution in the relationship that doesn't necessarily exist in other countries as of yet. So I'm going to cover some of these and what the implications are in terms of research and ethics and aging. So pharmaceutical industry. So I'm a geriatrician, and I prescribe medications to my patients. So the question is always, which medication and why. Now, I'm old enough to remember what it was like to treat certain diseases 
before certain medications existed. And it's quite remarkable when you think what the world was like before classes of medications that now we just take for granted. So I'm going to give you an example, just because it was, it's so vivid to me. When I was a medical student, I trained in Great Britain, in Scotland. But I'm not going to do, do the talk in Scottish, because then nobody would understand. <laughs> so when I was a medical student in Scotland, heart disease was very common. But the heart disease that was very common was rheumatic heart disease, which was related to rheumatic fever, which was very common in the 30s during the war, right after the war. And then with the advent of antibiotics and penicillin especially, it became less and less common for people who were old enough who had had it before the introduction of penicillin into common use. Many people had rheumatic heart disease. So in the town I studied in Dundee, Scotland, which was a real industrial revolution, remnant, factories, poor workers, rheumatic heart disease was everywhere. You could make the diagnosis on the bus, and we were told by professors, look for people who have evidence of rheumatic heart disease. And there were certain signs and symptoms that you could pick up on a bus. And you could see by the way they breathed, the way they walked, that they had probably mitral stenosis, as an example. And those who have lived in other countries that maybe are somewhat less developed probably still see evidence. And I did a, a rotation as a medical student in Poland in a children's hospital, everybody in the world had rheumatic heart disease and had signs that I had never seen in my life. Hearts that big, right? Corbovinum, as we call it. <clears throat> Heart of a cow. And it's very common for people with rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis especially, to go into heart failure. And it was usually because the rhythm of the heart changed from regular to what we call atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal, irregular rhythm. The heart can't pump effectively. The valve is very small, and fluid backs up into the lungs, and people literally drown in their own fluids. It's a true medical emergency. And at the time that I was in my training, mid-training, the treatment was still basically morphine, very good drug, for symptoms and also redistributes fluids. Digitalis, which is an old drug, which controls the rhythm. It takes time. You can give it intravenously, but it takes time to slow up the heart. And we didn't really have a diuretic, right? a drug that eliminates water and salt, that was particularly effective. There were diuretics, but they were very slow to act, and they also had a lot of deleterious effects on the kidneys. So one of the ways we treated people, sounds very primitive, was by venesection, i.e. taking blood out of the veins in large quantities. And that decreased the fluid return to the heart. It was simple. It was messy. Because at that time, we didn't have plastic cannulas. You put a big needle into a vein, usually here. You took a tube and basically ran the blood into any container, and it was usually some kidney dish or something, or large bottle, and the person would be sitting in bed, huffing and puffing, gurgling away, oxygen mask, morphine, and you waited to hope that the flu would go away before they died. It was a very critical illness. One evening when I was as a student, and I used to love to hang around the hospital, it was very exciting. And I was following the, what would have been called the house office, the intern around. Uh, and a woman came in, this young woman, late 20s probably, in florid pulmonary edema, fluid on the lungs, rheumatic heart disease. And we went to see her, and you know, everybody's starting to do this stuff. And he comes with the medical resident, it's, it's called a registrar. And um, they start talking to each other about a drug, and there's an ampule and a syringe, and somebody's writing down in a little book the demographic data, 28-year-old female, five-year history, blah, 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 blah. And uh, time, 
symptoms that I'm, you know, examining because I'm a eager medical student and I'm hearing bubbling and gurgling and wow, and I'm waiting for them to start putting the needle in to start drawing out the blood, and they give this injection. And within 10 minutes, all the fluid in her lungs disappeared. It was literally miraculous. And I hear them talking, because I'm only a medical student. Student, I, I was a medical student. I'm hearing them talk about the name of the, the number of the drug. And then she starts asking for a bedpan. And she starts peeing like crazy. And within an hour, she's fine. It was, it was literally miraculous. It's the first time I've done it. Now, what drug was that? No, the Jackson's old. Oh, that's uh, the furosemide. Lasix was the treatment. Furosemide. The first injectable, fast-acting diuretic. Now, that we were, I didn't know it, because at the time, well, what I know, we were part of a clinical trial of a drug that was developed in Switzerland, had been already done some trials, and I saw this happen. Now, the reason I'm using that as the example, because I could go through many drugs since my days of training in the, in the uh, 60s to now, that each one of these drugs changed the world of practice. And most of us who are not that old don't realize it. We somehow assume, well, of course, beta blockers, they, they, they must be around for a long time. I can remember, I was a resident when propranolol came in. I can remember when Cinemet came in, because I was a medical resident, and it changed the world. Now, the research that went into the development of drugs is very complex. It's very complex. And until it gets to market, a lot of stuff happens. And when it's done right, and when the drug is the kind of drug that changes the world, everybody's a winner. Obviously, the pharmaceutical industry is a winner because they make their investment. They're in business, and that's fine. The medical healthcare profession is a winner because they now have another treatment to offer. The patients who receive the treatment are with us because they have an outcome that they wouldn't have had before. And society is a winner. Because at the end of the day, one of the responsibilities of society is to look after, hopefully, its members. And that includes, certainly for those countries that have developed healthcare systems, they have a commitment to look after their members. Now, over the years, as all the drugs have come through, and the pharmaceutical industry has grown and developed, the challenge has been how many novel products can you come up with that would change the world, as opposed to how many products do you come up with that are really iterations of, modifications of, drugs that already exist, that the industry would like to use to replace what already exists. Hoping that in it, there'll be for them, obviously, a financial benefit. The question then becomes is, what does that mean for us, all the other players? And with the competitive need to demonstrate the benefit, there is a potential difficulty that may undermine the ethical commitments that one would normally expect from an industry to make sure that what they're doing is absolutely completely uh, congruent with our values because now we're doing something that has a potential for compromise, i.e., you want to bring a product to market, and you want to, you must convince the players, and that's the physicians, the public, and the payers, that your product is better than 
in one domain or another than what already exists. And that's a very powerful motivator. And unfortunately, as we've seen in the last year, with all kinds of other things in the world, the financial industry, the insurance industry, you name the industry that's facing enormous problems, many would say the problem has been the regulatory process by which we govern was somehow not as robust as it should be. People weren't examining what you're doing carefully enough. And whether it was what happened in China with the contamination of milk products, the ripple effect, which was enormous, the wisteria in Canada with the problem with the regulatory process for inspection, as an example, with the financial, and you can name many in which the question is, who was watching the process? Who was in charge of making sure we were doing what we're supposed to do? So an example in the pharmaceutical industry might be what happened a few years ago without naming the companies, but with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the newer ones, in which we as practitioners, and that means the public, were led to believe that certain new classes of anti-inflammatory agents were better, much better, safer, whatever term you want to use to convince people that they should switch from a drug that already exists, many of which are very cheap, to another drug in the same broad category for the same broad indications, inflammation, pain, but which are far more expensive, that we should somehow convince everybody, and that includes the third party payer, which may be a government, which may be a, a health management, depending on which country you live in, to switch prescribing practices. And for those who kept up with the media at the time, over a number of years, for whatever reason, the scrutineers, the reviewers, researchers in other fields who do health policy research, started looking into some of the data, research data, and found that it wasn't necessarily what the public, the profession, thought it was. And that was because a decision appeared to have been made by those somehow involved to perhaps not report everything as one might report it, ideally. And what it did was raise an enormous big question that affected the whole world, and I'm using a pharmaceutical research, but you could translate that into any health-related research in which there's an investment, one way or the other, by the players in having good outcomes. So when you think about it, I often refer to research as the research industry. It's a huge industry. I mean, when you think about it, look who's involved with this industry. First of all, all the researchers. There are a lot of people who, when you ask, what do you do, you say, I'm a researcher. And what does that mean? And wherever it came from, the inquiry into why things happen. Often researchers have had a background in science. Usually, they're going to do scientific research, it makes sense. And for whatever reason, what challenge them throughout their educational careers is finding answers. The inquiring mind. This is a long history of the human species of the inquiring mind. We can go back hundreds and hundreds of years and found there were people who wanted to know. What tools they had to know, may, we may look back and say, well, that was pretty primitive. But what they did with it was sometimes quite remarkable. If you think of Lister and Pasteur and Semmelweis, these are greats in the world of medical research. They had very little to work with. And yet they came up with ideas that they were able to follow through, some of which the outcomes haven't changed at all. Considering that they had nothing or very little to work with. I mean, people developed the idea that it must be a thing that we now call germs and the germ theory before they can identify them. 
But they put together, and they said, you know, it's funny how this can go to there, and this happens, and they didn't know that, you know, the rat was in between, and lice were in between, and yet they somehow figured out there must be a way of something going from one place to another. They, don't, they often got it wrong in terms of the detail, because they had no way of knowing what the players, what the pieces were. So for those who are interested in doing research, they're usually highly motivated in the acquiring mind. They want to know, what's the answer? It's like people who like crossword puzzles. Why does somebody do a crossword puzzle? Anybody do a crossword puzzle? Is the satisfaction, the challenge, and the satisfaction of the end is you look at it and every box is filled out. And for those who do them, and can't get a box filled out, they become obsessed. They become obsessed. And usually it happens one way or the other. The worst thing is if you have to look it up, because right? then you feel you fail, but that's okay. It's part of a learning process. For, so for the researcher, finding the answer matters. Now the problem is when you use that inquiring mind, but because the only way you can manifest it is to work for an enterprise that may not be totally committed to research in the, might say, pure form, i.e. research just for itself. And the thing that's interesting, even in the academic world, where one would have assumed and expected, and historical is the case, that research could be done just for research. Let your mind follow its inclinations. Let your mind think. And we see it in mathematical research and physics research. There's been an enormous tendency, which we understand because of the financial challenges, even for universities, to try to combine research with practical research. I research that can be translated clearly into some product. Now, it's easy to understand why one might do that. And for those of us who watched it, you say, well, of course, that makes sense. I mean, if you end up with research that can be translated to something useful, you say, yeah, that was good research. Look what we got out of it. If you look at the research that went into the discovery of the polio vaccine, you can understand why those virologists, who at the time were doing virology research, could say, boy, the challenge of finding a way of preventing polio. I was a young kid at the time. I remember it very well, how frightening it was when people got polio and either died or ended up in an iron lung or ended up paralyzed. So you can understand somebody who may have been a virologist just interested in virology getting a direction that says, we got to find a way of turning your theoretical virology into a vaccine. You can see that. And the challenge would be very, very com compelling. The problem is, if your research enterprise becomes more and more part of a commercial enterprise, the question becomes, what might you do in your research that will always result in some good outcome that whoever's running the show says, that's good because we now have a product. And the real question is, might people, whoever they are, including researchers, compromise the principles that must underpin research in order to end up with a good outcome. So think about it. You're a researcher. You've invested your career, your undergraduate, your postgraduate, your PhD, your postdoc. You've put a lot of years in to establish yourself as a researcher. And now you finally get your job. And you must succeed. Your family depends on it. Your psyche depends on it. You've got to succeed. 
And there's a lot of influences that could potentially determine how you succeed. Ideally, one would say, well, you succeed by doing good research. Isn't that the success? You've done good research. So the question is, well, what if your whole lifetime of research, which is good, valid, ethically principled research, i.e., you were always scrupulously careful, scrupulously honest, scrupulously in your recording, scrupulous in your procedures and protocols, and at the end of this career, nothing tangible occurred that you could say, this was mine. I mean, we know that negative research is not where you get your Nobel Prize or any equivalent. So you can imagine somebody feeling motivated to perhaps compromise the ethical principle, the ethical principles on which research should be based in order to succeed. And for those of us who are on the front line of practice, who assume that the research done by whoever is research we can count on, anytime somebody has compromised on their research ethics, whether it's related to pediatrics or geriatrics, which I'm particularly interested in, we all suffer. So there have been many examples over the years of people who have undertaken research projects that when you look at them with the retrospective scope or the wisdom of after, you say, how did this happen? How could it be that enough people who should have known better were willing to agree to allow this to go ahead? So in the annals of research history in the United States, for example, there was the Tuskegee uh, scandal. And this was a research protocol, Tuskegee. It's a, it's a place in, I think it's in Mississippi. I might be wrong. But I'm going to tell you. It's funny you should ask. They came up with a research protocol that basically said, we want to see the natural history of syphilis in a population which was almost exclusively Afro-American, poor, rural. We want to see the natural history of syphilis. And that meant they basically enrolled people, and I may have some details wrong, but it doesn't matter because the principle is there. They enrolled people in a study in which knowing that they had syphilis, they watched, watched it unfold. Now, if you look back at that with the principles of current research ethics, you could probably easily say, my God, this is after the Second World War, where we had already established principles during the Nuremberg trials that one could never again or should never again do research on people without what? Their informed Consent. So there wasn't informed consent, because in order to have informed consent, you'd have to tell people. So can you imagine what you'd have to tell somebody if you wanted to do a study that said, we're going to watch the natural evolution of syphilis at a time that penicillin already existed. Normally, if you said, first of all, nowadays you couldn't even get what would be principle, the principle of ethics were approval. It would be outlandish to imagine. But even in those years, I think this was in the I think it was in the 50s, I might be off. The Nuremberg trials established certain principles that you couldn't do research without consent. And the consent implies you tell people. So can you imagine what you'd have to tell somebody if you said, I'm gonna you diagnose that you have syphilis, there is a treatment. It's called penicillin. It's a pretty safe drug. It's a pretty effective drug. In fact, when used properly, it's curative. It'll stop where you are. 
but we're curious to see what happens if we don't treat you. Now, we've had hundreds and hundreds of years prior to penicillin where syphilis was not treated, and we knew what happened. I mean, when I was in medical school in the 60s, we studied syphilis. We looked at slides. We looked at pathological specimens. We, we knew what a gumma was. We knew what tertiary syphilis was. It's not as if we didn't know what the natural outcome of syphilis was. I said, well, why would you want to study? And how could you believe that if you told somebody that's what you're going to do, they'd say, sure, that sounds good. Nothing I would like more than developing tertiary syphilis. Right? I mean, it would be unimaginable. And yet, this study somehow was approved. Now, you'd have to go and look at all the details because I'm sure there was some justification. But in the normal framework of research ethics, it would be unthinkable to propose an intervention or not intervention without going through the process of consent. However, it still happens, and it still happens in the Western world. I know of a situation, and I won't name the country, but it's a Western country, in which a number of physicians were found to have undertaken a study in a group of elderly, long-term care, i.e. nursing home, chronic hospital patients, suffering from dementia, in which, in order to do the study, these people had to have a gastrostomy tube inserted. Gastrostomy tube is a feeding tube. Now, we use them a lot, clinically. But this wasn't a clinical decision. This was part of a research protocol. And as it turns out, the, the protocol was going along. Patients were having tubes put in them. And it turned out that only because a family member of a patient who had a tube put in asked the doctor, why was the tube put in? Now, if the doctor had said, because your mother can't eat, then the daughter, who was a daughter, would probably would have said, well, I understand that, but don't you normally have a discussion about that? I mean, normally in clinical medicine, before you do a material, not everyday treatment necessarily, but certainly in North America, it's, it's almost everyday treatment, but certainly a feeding tube, you would have a discussion that says, your mother can't eat. If we don't put in a feeding tube, she will die of inanition. And we believe a feeding tube is worthwhile because, because, because. And the family may say, you're right. Or they may say, you know what? My mother always said, I never want to feed. And the decision is made, that's a clinical decision. So the daughter, as I understand this particular case, questioned why the feeding tube was put in, somehow thinking it was a clinical reason, but she wasn't you know, informed of the discussion in place, only to find out that, in fact, it's part of a research protocol. Well, just imagine how you might feel if you found that your mother had been enrolled in a research protocol without, of course, her consent, because the mother has dementia, very common in late age, older individuals in nursing homes. And there was no permission with the proper informed consent from the person who would normally be responsible for making that decision, which would be the surrogate, the proxy, in this case, the, the family member. And for whatever reason, once this person found out about it, she was obviously unhappy. And she opened the door and made the inquiry only to find that this research protocol was going on. And many people had had feeding tubes put in as part of a research protocol. And none of them was the discussion provided with whoever the family members that this was part of a research protocol, which meant there were family members who may have believed it was clinical, maybe didn't have enough understanding to know that they could question if it was clinical. A lot of people are very passive 
write about medical decisions. They assume doctors do only the right thing. But this was not for clinical. This was a research protocol. Well, it ended up with a real scandal in that particular jurisdiction. And it opened up in the country the question of, do we have enough protection in the world of medical research for all these vulnerable people? Vulnerable meaning, if I took somebody who's in their 20s or 30s or 40s and said, I want to do something with you as part of a research protocol, the first thing you would say is, why? For what? What are the risks? What are the benefits? Why me? Right? Now, people are very generous with their willingness to participate in medical research. It's always amazing. How many people say, sure? You put a sign up on an elevator in a hospital looking for people with disease X between 25 and 35 with a phone call, and everybody's making phone calls. So well, why do people do that? For the most part, people are very, very beneficent and generous. But normally, you have to go through a process. And when this particular case came to the media, the response from some was, well, it was just one bad apple. But those are the people who you know, basically think we could just have to protect. And the others say, wait a second. This may be more common than we realize. And as people looked, they found that maybe not as an extreme, but it wasn't that uncommon. And the question then becomes, in the world of medical research, as we know it, are we taking the steps, which, which includes the regulatory steps, which may be a research ethics board, to make sure that the principles embodied in research ethics are always adhered to. That all the pressures that we all experience are not sufficient to allow us to compromise, or to force us to compromise. Because at the end of the day, the whole research enterprise can be undermined if we are not scrupulously careful about what goes into it. When I say critically undermine, that means that the people who now are willing to participate in research as subjects could possibly say, I won't do anything because I believe you're all out for your own good. That would be a disaster. And it could happen if we cannot demonstrate to the public that we are scrupulous in what we call medical research and what goes into it and are honest when we've done something that wasn't right. So we look at that case I mentioned earlier about the class of drugs. Initially, these large pharmaceuticals didn't come forward and say, you're right. What we submitted wasn't all the data. We knew there was other data that wasn't so perfect until it became obvious that they weren't completely transparent. Now, the good side of that particular event case was that the regulatory system, which we all depend on, in the United States it's the FDA, in Canada it's Health Canada, said, you know what, we're going to have to change the rules. In the same way that the outcome of the current financial disaster is people say, we have to change the rules. It should no longer be possible for you to do something with a financial product and call it something, I'm making this up, call it something else, <clears throat> right? If it's this, and it's this. So now, for example, if you do a study as a pharmaceutical company or any other that doesn't give you results that you want, in the old days, you just didn't publish it. Nobody knew about it. The only studies that ever get published were good ones, good outcomes. The rules of engagement have changed. The regulatory system says, you do a study, we don't care if it was a good study or a bad study. It has to be available for anybody to look at. It's in the public domain. 
so that when you get a good study, somebody could say, boy, that's interesting. That's really novel. Were there any other studies in the same area? And now you can't say no. So when you look, you say, gee, isn't that interesting? You had five bad studies, bad outcomes, unconvincing outcomes, and you had a good one. How come only the good one was published? Well, we know why, because the other part of the industry, which is the medical literature journals, they like to publish positive studies. There isn't a journal of negative medical studies. They'd have more submissions than they could deal with, because they're all the time. And we accept that in order to do good positive research, you have to fail a lot. But that's OK, except people should know what the failure was. Sometimes there's a good reason for the failure. It was the wrong protocol. It was the wrong technique. That doesn't mean it was a bad idea. It just may mean you chose the wrong materials, the wrong group of people. And if you look at aging and research, one of the problems has been until relatively recently, when you developed a protocol for, let's say, pharmaceutical research in the older population, you would often exclude people above the age of so-and-so. And this was very common in the non-steroidal era of earlier studies. You did them in people up to the age of so-and-so. The problem is once the drug was approved, who used it? The elderly. Why? Because they have muscular the, the skeletal disease. So here they were excluded from the study in terms of potential risks and side effects, but once the drug came out, they're the ones who use it, and then you picked up the pieces. So the, the, the uh, approach now and the, the uh, atmosphere has changed. So that a good, reputable company may say, if we're going to develop a product for which an older population is likely to be using it, we better include them in the protocol. Now, that's not easy. That's the problem. It's much harder to get older people in <coughs> medical protocols than younger, because they have all kinds of problems and who's going to get permission, and can you get a surrogate for medical? A lot of things come up. And there was a time that it was believed that you couldn't do research on somebody with dementia because you had to get the consent from somebody else. And the idea was, well, that means you can't do research on people with dementia. Well, how are we going to find out treatments for dementia if you came to research on it? So we had to compromise what was reasonable, as long as the, the regulations were there to protect people. So bringing it all together to finish the session, the enterprise of research, its underpinnings of ethics, and its relationship to aging are intertwined in such a way that we can't forget any of the components. I use aging as an example only because the population is particularly vulnerable. In other words, if you've misread or misrepresented the outcomes of your research, the impact can be devastating because the population is particularly vulnerable. You don't have a lot of room for error. In a younger population, even though you may have unanticipated negative outcomes, the room for error may be greater just by the nature of the resiliency of the younger person. So we have to be scrupulous as medical researchers and for those of us as clinicians to make sure that those doing the research are doing it in a way that we can trust because we cannot separate basis of the research in good science, the ethical principles that underpin it, and the fact that the population is particularly vulnerable, and we have to make sure we always protect them. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I don't know, do you have questions? or uh, I, I'm easy. Can I, am I allowed to sit down now? Yes. So I'm not gonna, I, this is hard to do without all that PowerPoint stuff. Doing it on the fly. You know, remember uh, uh, Cipro? Cipro. Uh, you mean the antibiotic, Cipofloxacin? Mm -hmm. No, Cipro-Bain. No, not cipro uh, Same company, they released uh, a statin uh, that caused a lot of death. And then quickly, the, the 
they would go from the market. Right. I can't remember which product, but the principle is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, when they do the, the uh, phase three, yeah, and they want to fully launch it to the, to the market, they want to make sure that it doesn't harm so many people. Like a lot of people that I remember in Japan, right? I think the United States. And, uh, yeah. This is a whole new challenge in the use of populations for clinical trials, and it's a real ethical challenge, not unique to the elderly, but to the concept of clinical trials. Who do you choose for subjects? Ideally, the subject should be the people for whom the drug will be used, right? And we know that for some populations, getting enough people to participate in studies is not easy. And therefore, you often have multi-site trials so that you go to a lot of places in order to get enough people, which have some benefits and some risks. But we see more and more people doing research, pharmaceutical companies, going to less developed countries to get subjects for their research. Now, for some, it makes sense because the disease you're looking at is that of a less developed country. Like you wouldn't do research on malaria in Chicago, because you probably are not going to have any cases. You're going to do research in malaria in a place where malaria is endemic. With HIV, we're seeing that obviously there are populations all over the world, but there are some areas where it's absolutely almost systemic. So you might say, well, that's a good place to go because there's so many cases, but you have to be careful that the driver isn't, that that's a good place to go because it's going to be easy to get consent because the people are not as perhaps sophisticated to understand what this is all about. Or they may be willing to participate in the study because they're getting something that otherwise they couldn't get, which is treatment. So we have to be very careful when we look at studies that go to other jurisdictions and countries that what's gone into the protocol and the subject population isn't, in a sense, motivated by factors that aren't what you would call good ethical-based factors, i.e., the people can participate as informed, knowledgeable people who can also say no without compromising their status. And I can tell you I've been involved in studies, even in Canada, by reputable large international firms, that after the study, which was for the drug that one would assume would can be continued long term, that initially after the study, basically when the investigators, of which I was one, said, well, what about the people who've been on the active drug and the outcome was good and want to stay on the active drug but can't afford it? What are you going to do? And the initial response was, that's not our problem. We enrolled them in the study. And a group of us said, wait a second. You enroll them in a study based on their good will and willingness to participate, and you now have a product from which you could probably generate multiple millions of dollars. Imagine the conversation that you could generate multiple millions of dollars and you're not willing to provide that drug for the person for how long they need it. You've got to be kidding. If that came out as your standard of practice, I can assure you all of us who agreed to participate in your study will never do that again. How long do you think it took for them to reverse their policy? It could be measured in milliseconds. When they realized not the powerful ethical argument, which you would hope would have done it, that the bell would have gone off. But the fact is they could lose something very important, and that is the willingness of doctors 
to help them find, remember, we find the patients. Can you imagine if you said to a patient, I want you in a study, if it turns out that, you know, the drug is good and you should take it for the rest of the life, you can't afford it, well, tough. Too bad. They're just going to use you. You know, people say, I don't want to be a guinea pig. Well, that's what you are. So we have to be very, very, very careful that we make sure that we hold whoever's doing the research accountable, not just for the good science, but for the good ethical principles, because you can't separate them. Anything else? I have one. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, do you remember, uh, till now, how many angiotensin we have? 16? You know, I don't know, but there are many. But this is ridiculous, you know? I mean, the, the thing is between the doctors and the companies, and everybody, everyone come and tell you, look, try this, this is very good. But turn out all of them the same, more or less. And they keep bullying you about this yeah. issue. But this is another component of the world of pharmaceutical research. And I don't want to beat up on the pharmaceutical industry, because at the end of the day, we would have nothing in terms of modern pharmaceuticals without them. So we have to be careful. But that doesn't mean it's open season. They have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. Everybody has a responsibility. So the question of the Me Too drug, i.e., same basic compound with a minor change, we say minor, for those who study biochemistry, which in my youth, youth, youth I did, with a minor change, you stick a CH3 here, you put an orange there, it changes the drug from the point of view of marketing of copyright, etc. And then the question is, <clears throat> when you do the studies, are the effects substantially different? And substantially depends on what you call substantial. There may be differences. It then becomes the responsibility of the regulators, if they're acting responsibly, to determine what it is you can say about the drug. So, for example, the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, ODB, the Drug Quality and Therapeutics Committee, which determines which drugs are funded for the population, so over 65 and people on social assistance, they go through a process in which they evaluate all the data and say, look, I always use when I give these seminars, you've just come up with fancy mycin. And you're saying that it is substantially better than not so fancy myself, to the point that it should be remunerated, and I'll make this up, at a level that's one and a half times not so fancy myself. And our studies show that the benefits of fancy medicine, fancy medicine, are worth the extra money. And if you go into a physician's office, you can present data that might be compelling. Because we all know, depending on how you present the data, it may look better or worse. Because you're not necessarily presenting all the data that exists. The regulator, in this instance, the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, has the responsibility of two things, saying, when all is said and done, the difference between fancy mycin and not so fancy mycin is not particularly significant other than for this subgroup, i.e., those people, for whatever reason, can tolerate not so fancy medicine, but tolerate fancy medicine. Fancy medicine. I'm using it, I'm making up it. And we, the province, will not pay for the drug other than for those people in this little subset. And if you, as the doctor, want it, you're going to have to explain why. It's called a limited use, section aid, whatever it is. So then when the pharmaceutical representative comes in, that pharmaceutical representative is going to have to explain to the doctor what the funding is. And for those of us who look after the elderly, we know to get an older person on a limited income to pay for a drug that they can get another drug just like it paid for, you're going to have to do a lot of explaining. And if we're honest and knowledgeable, we should be able to say the difference is negligible. 
And if it's significant, we will apply and explain. So there is a tension in the dynamic. The industry, I believe, the reputable companies are learning that they actually end up succeeding better when they're scrupulously honest. Because at the end of the day, anything you do that's not will be found out. So I will quote my, la my late grandmother, who was a model in my life. Came over when she was 15 from Lithuania, worked in the garment industry in New York, and she always said, honesty is the best policy. And I haven't heard anybody, and that is translated, I'm sure, how many languages are in the world? A thousand, ten, in every language, I'm willing to bet it exists. Right? And it's so. Because at the end of the day, we, the human species, depend on each other's honesty to sustain us for surviving. Because once we're dishonest, ultimately we undermine our abilities to survive. Even though short term we may gain something, long term we lose. So thank you very much for participating. And I wish you all well. And for those who didn't come because of the weather, you're not getting a cup of coffee. <laughs> you can have it at all. Bye-bye. <laughs>